And uh, he's coming back again. You say, why does he have to come back? Because most of the prophecies about him aren't fulfilled yet. Um, most of the Bible prophecies, I'd say, uh, some people have said 90%. I don't know if it's that much. Maybe 80%. There's a lot of them. There's, there's more of them that are unfulfilled than have been fulfilled. Um, but they talk about his coming kingdom. And uh, last week we studied that Jesus left and is coming uh, back again. Um, and the Bible predicts that he comes and goes. Uh, turn to Psalm 68 again. Psalm 68. And we're going to look at verses 18 and 19. Now, I don't know about you, but I do get a blessing out of reading the Psalms. I figured me out a chart where I could read the Psalms uh, through um, in a few months. It takes me more than uh, Proverbs I can read through in a month, but Psalms takes a little longer. It, it, it takes like uh, three or four months to read through the Psalms, reading one a day. But it's it been an exceeding uh, blessing to me. Um, but a lot of the Psalms really don't apply to you doctrinally. You can get some kind of uh, spiritual uh, blessing from them. Um, but you can't, you can't apply them too hard in some places because it just ain't so. Uh, there's a lot of the Psalms that talks about the righteous and the wicked. Well, you know, generally you can apply that to a sinner and then a saved person if you want to. But you have to watch what it says. Um, God doesn't necessarily... The Bible says that God hates the wicked every day. Well, what does that mean? That God hates all the sinners out here that aren't saved? Well, I, some people believe that. Some people teach that. I think there's some that he might get to that point. But the Bible says, For God so loved the world. So there you have two verses that seem to contradict each other. If you make the wicked into the average sinner. But if you study the word the wicked in the Bible, you'll find it's a reference to the devil himself. Well, of course the, God hates the devil. He's the antithesis of what God is. Uh, now, those that are his disciples and he's got them in the, his pocket and folks that uh, maybe never are going to get saved, uh, they may partake of God's hatred. Uh, but God gives people every chance he can to be saved. And uh, so you have to be careful when you're reading the Psalms. But here we have in Psalm 68 a prophecy of what Jesus did when he was on the earth first time. And then in the second verse, you can see that's a prophecy of the, the church age. So let's read uh, Psalm 68 verse 18. It says, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Salah. Now, that's talking about the church age. That's the prophecy. First of all, it talks about him leading captivity captive. That's a prophecy of all those people that went down into the middle of the earth into Abraham's bosom. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon. Um, you say, well, who all's in there? Well, you can't tell. Uh, I would certainly say that the saints that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 over there. But you get to the end of Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, you know what? It, it, it kind of uh, it, it, it stops naming names and just giving situations. And several of those situations over there in Hebrews 11 can, can apply to several people in the Old Testament. Um, and then you have people that are questionable. You don't know if they went to heaven or not or Abraham's bosom or not. Uh, like uh, Samson. Because um, Samson, he got his uh, salvation from the Lord and his strength. 
And then he cut his hair, disobeyed God. God took his strength away from him. And by implication, uh, his salvation from him. And then right there at the end, he asked God to give him his strength back. And so God did, and henceforth, uh, he might be there in Abraham's bosom. Because uh, uh, it seems God blessed. He ended up fulfilling God's purpose for his life at the end there, even though he'd messed the rest of his life up. Um, so those people have been captive down there. The whole time they're dying in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ dies on the cross. He completes their salvation because... Up until the time that Jesus came and died on the cross, God merely forgave sins. He didn't, uh, he didn't cover them. He didn't remove them. Uh, when we get saved, God uh, not only covers our sins, but he removes them. Amen. He takes them away. And there's another verse that talks about putting our sins away as far as the east is from the west. That's a prophecy of what he does in the church age. So... Here we have the ascension of God. Thou hast received gifts for men. Uh, yea, for the rebellious also. Uh, well, Corinthians, we, got, uh, we studied 1 Corinthians, and it has a whole list of gifts that God gives the people in the church. And, you know, sometimes God gives a gift to somebody that's a little rebellious. I've met a lot of preachers that seem to have a, a streak in them. Uh, they're not going to pay attention to what man says. They're they're gonna they're just gonna rub against the grain, uh, like it or not. Uh, and sometimes they run afoul of God. Some of them I've seen through the years. Um, but God doesn't uh, uh, God doesn't make them lose their salvation in this age. Uh, they're still going to heaven, uh, and He still gives them the gifts. Uh, so you see, it's talking about the church age uh, that the Lord God may dwell among them now. See that comma after rebellious also? That that the Lord God may dwell among them. That's actually talking about Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, you say, well, it's backwards. They got the resurrection first, and they got the Jesus' earthly ministry when he's among men the second. Well, now, you need to note that. Because many times in the Old Testament, when it talks about the first and second advent, and it talks about them together... It gives them in reverse order. And that happens over and over and over again. You say, why does God do that? Well, you know, there's some people that think they're smarter than God. Amen. And if you believe what God said and you compare Scripture with Scripture, you'll pick up on the fact that those things are reversed every time. It's not real tricky. This isn't real hard to understand. But God put that in there for all those... Uh, um, smarter than thou, folks. And I've met a lot of those. <laughs> a lot of them. Uh, most of your cults are filled with people like that. They, uh, it appeals to them. All right, verse 19. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. So there you go back to the church age again, where God gives benefits to his children. Uh, there's not a person in here that's saved that can't say that. God has given you a lot of things you don't deserve and benefits that you didn't earn. God just gives them to you because you're his child and he loves you. Ain't it great? Isn't it wonderful? Uh, what does the old song says? Oh, what needs we often forward? Oh, what needs we uh, you know, often bear? All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. You see, the prayer is a benefit. So, well, it's a, it's a, no, it's a benefit. You look at other religions. Um, these people that have the little statues in their house. Well, you know, they have to go through all kinds of murgamarole just to get in touch with their God. And they're not sure they got in touch with anything when they're done. Um, I was watching some little show about Tibet. And it showed this Buddhist temple. And they're ringing bells and they're flipping beads and they're, you know, chanting around. They got these great big horns. You know. And, and so what are they doing for? They're trying to get Buddha's attention. Well, I don't got to do that to get God's attention. I don't even have to bow on my knees to get God's attention. I don't even have to close my eyes to get God's attention. 
Um, God's got lots of benefits for us. So there you see that Jesus, it's prophesied that he's going to ascend on high. And he did. He fulfilled that. Look at Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30. Now, I read this every month and it amazes me what God did put in the Bible. Um, I, I really don't understand how most of the Sadducees and Pharisees missed out on knowing Jesus was the Messiah. I suspect some of them knew and they rejected him. Just like their forefathers rejected God. You had some that took him up, like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They were rulers of their people. And um, they were good disciples. They took care of Jesus when nobody else would. All his regular disciples were in hiding. So they came out and said, okay, we want the body of Jesus. We're going to bury it. We're his friends. We believe in him. They didn't have to do that. And, and you know, they went right to Pilate. They didn't mess around with going to their own rulers, they went right to the Roman guy. Uh, I think they realized that God had touched Pilate's family. I, I mean, that, that there's a story in the Bible about uh, Pilate's wife having a dream about Jesus. He, uh, he did what he did, but boy, I tell you what, I bet there was many a sleepless night after Jesus' death and resurrection. He didn't know what was going on. Proverbs 30 verse number 4 it said who hath ascended up into heaven or descended well this is why I say Jesus went down into the bowels of the earth he dropped off your sins in hell he picked up the saints of the captivity that were captive and then he came back up again uh, who have gathered the wind in his fists huh well I remember on the sea of Galilee he went, whoa, winds. <laughs> whoa. Who hath bound the waters in his garment, in a garment? Uh, a guy walked upon the water. Who hath established all the ends of the earth? Now, some of this has to do with the second advent. Uh, what is his name? Well, do you know his name? His name is Jesus. Jesus. There's something about that name. And what is his son's name? So it's talking about Jehovah and his son Jesus. If thou canst tell. Every word of God is pure. Now ain't it a quinky dinky that right after it asks what the son of God's name is, it talks about the word of God. What did the Bible say was the word of God? Jesus was the word of God. Amen. He was the living word. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield of now notice it doesn't say it is a shield. If you were writing this in proper English and every word of God uh, would be a neutral. It wouldn't be a he. Well, it's not talking about a book. It's talking about a he. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. June the 4th, 1973. 7200 Marywood Street. Hyattsville, Maryland. There was a little 13-year-old boy in the bedroom up on the second story. At night, about 12.30 midnight, I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. When did you put your trust in the Lord? And you know what? He's a shield to me. And he's a shield to you if you've trusted him. Oh, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Well, I tell you what, that's, that's some little passage of scripture there, now ain't it? That amazes me that there that is in the middle, in the middle of the Proverbs, or at the end of the Proverbs. And look up there in verse number one. The words of uh, Agur, the son of uh, Jacob, even the prophecy, uh, the man spake unto Ephiel, even unto Ephiel and Eucal. I have no clue who those people are. Neither do you. 
Yet God spoke to those men and gave them some, and somehow Solomon ran across it and put it in the book. Why? Because God wanted him to. His son's name. What does Jesus mean? Well, Jesus is a Greek form of Joshua. What does Joshua mean? Does anybody know? It means Jehovah saves. So the son's name is Jehovah saves. Oh boy. Jesus left us. He's coming back again. But you know, he really didn't leave us. He lives inside of us, spiritually, by His Holy Spirit. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I looked at those clouds this morning when I was driving up to the church. and uh, Nice fluffy white clouds. Now, me and you, we could take an airplane... And our helicopter, if we could get that high, I doubt we could with a helicopter. But, you know, if you, you, you got to the top of one of those clouds and could, could make the, the helicopter hover, and you stepped out of the helicopter, uh, you're not going to be able to stand on that cloud. You know what's going to happen to you? You're going to whoop. Meow. Hope you brought your parachute. But Jesus, he can do anything. He's going to come stand on a cloud someday and he's going to call his children home. They're going to be gathered from the east. They're going to be gathered from the west. They're going to be gathered from the south. They're going to be gathered from the north. They're going to be gathered from every tongue, race, nation, people. All those who have believed on him through the whole church are going to just, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we which are alive and remain. Ephesians 4 verse 8. Now, Paul is dealing with this prophecy back there in Proverbs. He says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Now, that, that's he's dealing with the Psalms 68. And gave gifts unto men. And then verse 9 deals with Proverbs. Now, he that ascended... What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Jesus is a part of the Trinity, and God is bigger than anything he ever made. And we're physically, we're living inside God, technically. The whole universe is. But this is not talking about Jesus becoming that big. Uh, he's talking about fulfilling all of God's word. And he had to go back to heaven to kick in God's plan for man. Now, God's original plan was that everybody was going to obey him. Uh, when did that go out of the picture? Well, you had this friend named Noah show up. And... Because everybody else was misbehaving, God picked on one family and said, okay, you're it now. Uh, and so God tried a little harder, and all of a sudden, uh, this guy named Abraham showed up. And God required a lot from these guys, but they had to have some faith in the heart. He wouldn't mess with them. And that went down to Moses. Well, Moses brought in the law. God says, okay, a uh, little bit of faith, a whole lot of works. <laughs> this was a whole lot of faith, a little bit of works. Um, and that went till you got Jesus dying on the cross. Now we have an age. Where we don't have to work for anything. We don't have to work to get saved. We don't have to work to stay saved. We have to work if we want to get rewards in heaven. We have to work if we want to please God. But you can just sit around on your do nothing the whole Christian life if you want to. And I know lots of Christians that do. And you'll still go to heaven. Now you may not have anything when you 
you get there. Your mansion may be itty bitty, and somebody else's may be bigger. I don't know how all that works. Neither do you. Yeah, amen. But uh, you don't have to worry about working for it. You don't have to worry about working for it. And Jesus came, and this whole time, there's all kinds of things Jesus ticked off of what the Messiah was going to do. And, and he, had to, he had to come the first time, and he had to go back into heaven, so all this stuff would start ticking off. Now, God started picking on the Jews right here, right? I'll get to my point. I haven't got to my point yet. And he dealt with the Jews all the way till after Jesus went to heaven. And when the disciples first went out to preach, who were they preaching to? Who was in the church? It was the Jews. You read Acts chapter 2 and all those people, they may have lived somewhere else amongst the Gentiles, but they came back to Jerusalem because they were Jews. And God wanted to say, he saved a bunch of them. Well, then as Christianity spread out, it started spreading out for the Jews. But God kind of played a little trick on them. God knew that eventually those Sadducees and Pharisees that wouldn't receive Jesus... They weren't going to receive this either. And they didn't. So, I had one, one guy, on the, he preached to people, he was an evangelist, and that was Philip. And one day God plunked him in the middle of the road after he got done preaching somewhere, and here comes a chariot riding along, and there's this Ethiopian fellow in the chariot. Big, big, I mean, he's an important, important dude. Uh, he worked for the royal household of Ethiopia. Um, and uh, so uh, he's reading a book. And uh, when Philip gets up closer, he notices, oh, he's got the book of Isaiah out there. And hey, fella, you understand what you're reading in that book of Isaiah there? Well, no, I ain't got a clue what this guy's trying to tell me. Do you understand this stuff? Oh, yeah, I can explain it to you. I'll oh, climb over my hand and do so. And so they wrote down, maybe they stopped, I don't know what they did, they wrote a long reading book. And what Philip did was he explained the gospel to him. And Philip must have been sitting there praying and saying, well, Lord, this guy, he's a Jew, he's a guy from Africa. I mean, he looks different than me, he talks different than me, uh, he's more different than me. And I'm supposed to tell him about Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and God said, tell him the story, dummy. Probably, what God does to me. Shut up and talk about what you're supposed to talk about. And so he showed him there, and, and, and the guy the guy received Christ. This Gentile guy from Africa. And then all of a sudden you're getting the Greek saved, and, and all these other people that aren't Jews. And by the time you get to the book of Acts, well, Paul is saying, look, guys, I'm starting to fight with you all Jews. Everywhere I go, you give me trouble and you fight me and I'm trying to give you the truth and you don't want it. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just cut you off and go preach to these people over here. And that's what happened. And for 2,000 years, Gentiles have got saved. On every continent. Speaking every language. The gospel is gone. Um, this is why we talk about missions around here. That's the main work of the church, is missions. Sending people to other places to preach the gospel. Now you and me, we can stay here. If we, did, if we did what, literally what the Bible said at the end of Matthew, we would pick up and we would go everywhere preaching the gospel. But it's impractical to do that, so through the centuries, we learn how to send other people on our place and help them. And that's what we do. We pay their living. We help them buy food. We, uh, you know, they need some literature. We send that. You know, whatever they need, we, we try to help them. And there's been periods when that didn't go on in the church. And those were called things like the Dark Ages. I wonder why it was called the Dark Ages. Because the light had gone out. Or it was down, turned down so little no one could see it. 
So here we have God ticking it off with Jesus coming back from the grave. It's, it's, it's like that refrigerator I keep describing. Uh, God formed the body of Christ. Um, nobody was in it. He died for the body of Christ. Nobody was in it. Uh, then he arose from the grave. And all of a sudden people started going in it. But the trouble is it wasn't quite turned on yet. So they had to leave the door open so the food wouldn't spoil. And so Pentecost comes along. He plugs that thing in. And he starts putting people away in, in, his, in his, his body. And people have been going into that body for 2,000 years. Most of them have died and gone to the grave. Their spirits have gone up to heaven to be with Jesus. Their body, most of their bodies is gone. Now, this is where we get into some tricky things here with people nowadays. Um, there was a time when I thought burial was the only proper way for a Christian after they died. And if you want to be buried, that's a good thing. I, I'll say this, if you can afford it. There's a terrible thing that's happened in America. We've had this thing called the funeral industry. The funeral industry? It's become an industry. So instead of going and buying a pine box or having somebody make you a box, some friend of yours or something like they did in the old days, and going to the church and having the preacher have somebody in the church dig a hole and put the box down in the thing and then you go find a gravestone when you can afford it. That's, that's how it used to happen. Now you go to a, a funeral home and you sign up for a, a $25,000, $30,000 funeral. And that's how much they cost. So if someone goes out and gets cremated for a couple thousand dollars, you know what? I'm going to quit saying anything bad about them because where's the Apostle Paul nowadays? His body. What do you think it looks like after 2,000 years? I, I say, if, you, if you've got the money, go ahead and get buried. But if you go out and your family can't afford it, you get cremated, well, you know what? God can put you back together because he's God. And I, and I, I spent a long time praying about this. I, I, I have a thing that I made up. I've never taught it here. But it's a five-page thing on why you should get buried because the Bible teaches it. Well, and that's all well and fine. But you know, there is no commandment in the New Testament or the Old Testament that you have to get buried. What about all those people that were in fires? What about people that were in cities that got bombed during wartime or, uh, you know, uh, a lot of wartime, they, they just dug a pit and they took a bulldozer and they just scooped everybody in and covered them up. They didn't bother to put them in a box or uh, marinate their body in formaldehyde or whatever they do to it to preserve it. Um, but he's going to come back and get everybody, no matter what state they're in. He's going to put them back together. You say, well, that's amazing because all the mole... Yeah, that's how big God is. That he knows every molecule in your body and he's aware of what happens to it after you're gone. It's sure amazing. Sure amazing. And he'll put you back together. Uh, let's face it, even if you're a corpse in a, in a, in a coffin, you're not a, you wouldn't want to live like that forever, would you? Be some... Skeleton out of a closet. Uh, I mean, uh, a coffin. No, he's going to put some kind of skin on you. He's going to put some kind of bones in you. He's going he's to he's, he's gonna fix you up with a body just like he had. And you're going to live eternally. Have eternal life. Physically. But that couldn't start till he came up from the grave. And he had to fulfill these two little prophecies. Way back in the Old Testament. Um, verse number 11, Ephesians 4. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith. 
The day of the rapture is the day we come in the unity of the faith. All the saved, uh, well, back in the early days of Christians, they didn't call them Baptists and Presbyterians. They were Nestorians, and they were Paulinians, and they were uh, uh, Waldensians, and Albigensians, and all these people that came through the Middle Ages uh, that you probably never heard of some of them, say people from from Europe and say people in Asia. Uh, the, some of the oldest churches in the world are in the continent of, of India, where, where the apostles went. Um, and the, the people are just, they're, they're going to come up out of those graves, they're going to get new bodies, and then when everybody's up there with Jesus, then we're going to go with Jesus if we're still here. I was sitting there last night, and we were looking at... Uh, couple Bill Gaither show, one on one channel, and when it was off, we switched to another channel. And i tell you what, um, so what happens sometimes? Well, I, uh, you can ask my wife, sometimes I just get swollen. So why? Because I miss my folks. I miss, I, I miss my family that say, I, I miss my brothers and sisters in Christ that have gone on. Boy, I miss them sometimes. Times bad. I, you know, there's been a lot of times since I've become pastor that I would give a nice sizable sum of money if I could sit down with Brother Bill one, one time and ask him some questions again. So, Brother, what would you do? How would you handle this? But one day, we're all going to sit around the throne. Praise Jesus together and have a grand reunion day, boy. And that's going to be the day. And it all started when Jesus went away. And next week, we're going to look at his promise that he made. He made some promises. And it's not over yet. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. I pray you help us. To understand these Bible verses, Lord, thank you, Lord. I I, I don't understand what you're going to do uh, when the rapture gets here. Uh, it's inex inexplicable uh, to folks that believe in science, um, and and it's certainly in inexplicable to somebody like me, um, Lord. Uh, it, it's it's kind of like having a vase, Lord, and uh, breaking it so, so much it's just little bitty pieces. And yet, somehow, you're able to put all them little bitty pieces together one day and take us all home to be whole. And God, we're not whole yet. Even of us that's walking around on, on the planet, God, we have this old flesh, and it has infirmities. And God, it, it lets us down. It tempts us. It it's a, it's a pain, God. But yet you encourage us to soldier on and run the race and, and do your will, God. God, so that one day when you do come back and we see you face to face, God, we can look you in the eye and be glad we're there. And you can be happy with us and say, well done. Well done. God, please help us. Come back today. Isn't it time yet, Lord? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's take a break.